friends. So welcome you all. So on behalf of Tamil Nadu Science Forum, uh, I would like to welcome you all. This is the 30, 33rd lecture. Uh, that's the popular science lecture that we have, we started conducting from June 2018 onwards. And this is going to be the 14th lecture since we are going into the, uh, the virtual mode. Um, since the start of the pandemic times. Uh, so our main participants are um, uh, students, researchers, uh, and the science activists, and those professionals who missed to take science as their career. They are our regular visitor, uh, uh, regular participant. We have, a, um, uh, we also upload our uh, video in the YouTube channel, the PSL YouTube channel. I would like you to subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can see all our uh, previous uh, lectures in the YouTube channel. So this lecture is going to be on um, the COVID-19 vaccine. So we have with us uh, Dr. Sandhya uh, Kaushik from TAFR. So I welcome you, ma'am. And uh, this lecture is going to last for 40 to 45 minutes, followed by a question and answer session. Before that, um, uh, we, the organizer, want to introduce the Tamil Nadu Science Forum. Uh, Dr. Ramanujam will introduce the, the Tamil Nadu Science Forum. He will take a few minutes. After that, Dr. Krishna Sami will introduce the speaker. Um, so thereafter, the speaker will take the mantle and the lecture will start. Thank you. And really, I never come on a come. Tamil Nadu, I really come. Cut on the Tamanatil Larvial Parapu the Pani Sir Mundri Krade, Ure Nanga in the research scholars, Chennai Pagalikar had led Kapudia, still a PhD student, research scholars, and Nanga left, Professor Gondraj and Pukoda Karinga. So our Illa Sair in the Arbita Wundre. In the Maha Tulir and Rupatri Vilikri, the Tulir Patri Haker and the Mupat <laughs> Mula maha makalidam arivele petri pes wede. Adematu malla arivele arivele parisod ini kelai. Palla aranggan gelil seidi kandu kete. I think matra science popularization, science communication ini pesu kodiya. Matra aranggan gelil rende kunci vidyas mana orang raha nan solam mudiyum. Teru moni kelil indro gunde arivele parisod ini kelai seidi katu wede ini dalam. Orang ramah suara semanu orang biasa. Madar ke makar mati ini ke kodi awal awal pun ramah mukia mana tu. Ini tapi re. Pala mihom mukia makah wanwiel wanwiel lepet tu salur mukir. Tolenu kik edtu kundu teleskop edtu kundu gram anggalil salur mukir. Terikalil salur mukir. Makar mati ini ke kodi awal awal pun. Tolenu kik mula makah chandra nai par pado, biara nai par pado, sani graha tay par pado. Adil eri nde barak kodi arivil wara yada kert. Idu pon tru palagaramana oti kelai. Wajtu kundu arivil para pada le seidu eri lede. Id inda id matu malam le arivil kalvi ilum suhada aratilum kuri paha pengal udaiya suhada aratil pengal udaiya udal nala til. Mika aaraman palapani kelai palawari tenggelah seidu eri lede. Tama nada arivil ikam. Ado udu oru angga maha makar madhil popular science lectures yang ada. Inda inda madri ana mui achil arivil arinjar kel. Pala benda mana minyak ni kel, makhluk lodi sendiri tu pesu itu, bodoh makhluk lodi. Anjra ya, arivial sahanda pala keretikalai, vivadi pada, ini, mereka mukim mana orang pania arivial ekam keretikalai. Yang entral, nampu dia anjra ada war kehil, irwat orang nontra andil irukum nama ke, arivial um toil um pamum, pala benda ni kelil nama badi kerade, ini dal arasangga medukum mudi bukal. Puduah, samuk, orang samuk mak nama mereka kau kodiya, mudi bikal, awat chill, arivialum, evidence based decision making ini persoal barke, dah awal de, arivial, tuh ini lupa, sahanda, karena karya marindu, ayvin adipadayil, mudi bikal ayadu padu, 
இது நம்முடைய பொதுவாழ்வில் மிகவும் குறைவாகத்தான் இருக்கிறது அந்த அடிப்படையில் மக்கள் மத்தியில் அன்றாட இஷ்யூஸ் எதுவாக இருந்தாலும் அவற்றை அறிவியல் சார்ந்து விவாதிப்பது அதற்கான அரங்கங்களும் மேடைகளும் அமைத்து தருவது அறிவியலுடைய மிக முக்கியமான பணியாக கருதப்படுகிறது அந்த குறிப்பிட்ட பணியில் இந்த ஒரு லெக்சர் சீரீஸ் மிக முக்கியமான ஒரு பணியை செய்து வருகிறது கடந்த ஒரு வருடமாக நாம் இது போன்ற ஆன்லைன் வடிவம் மூலமாக சந்தித்து கொண்டிருக்கிறோம் இதில் பலவிதமான கோவிட் சம்பந்தப்பட்ட பலவிதமான இஷ்யூஸ் பற்றி பேசி வருகிறோம் இதில் மிக முக்கியமாக இன்றைக்கு நாம் அனைவரும் மிக கவலையோடும் ஆதங்கத்தோடும் காத்து கொண்டிருக்கிற ஒன்று என்னவென்றால் இந்த தடுப்பு மருந்து கோவிடுக்கான தடுப்பு மருந்து வரப்போவதை பற்றி இது பற்றி பேசியே ஆக வேண்டிய புரிந்து கொள்ள வேண்டிய ஒரு தருணத்தில் நாம் இருக்கிறோம் நாம் தெரிந்து கொள்ளும் ஒவ்வொன்றும் நாளைக்கு களத்தில் சென்று கிராமங்களில் சென்று மாவட்டங்களில் சென்று நாம் பலருக்கும் இதோடு இது பற்றி பேச இருக்கிறோம் அந்த பேசுவதற்கு முன்னால் நமக்கு தேவையான கலந்துரையாடலாக இன்றைக்கு நாம் சந்திக்கிறோம் இதற்கு சந்தியாவை விட மிக பொருத்தமான யாரையும் நாம் நினைக்க முடியாது என்று நினைக்கிறேன் கடந்த ஒரு வருடமாக கோவிட் குறித்து மக்கள் மத்தியில் நாம் செய்து கொண்டிருக்கக்கூடிய நாம் என்று சொல்லும் பொழுது அகில இந்திய அளவில் செய்து கொண்டிருக்கக்கூடிய பணிகளில் மிக முக்கியமான ஒன்றாக சந்தியாவின் தலைமை பண்பு இதில் இருந்து கொண்டிருக்கிறது அவரை நாம் இன்று வரவேற்கிறோம் நன்றி ஜெயம் இப்போ டாக்டர் சந்தியா கௌஷிகா ஒரு பிரபலமான உற்சாகமாக ஆழமாக வேலை செய்யும் ஒரு அறிவியலாளர் அறிவியலாளர் மட்டும் இல்லை அவங்க வந்து ஷர்லா ஹோம்ஸ் எப்படி போய் டிடெக்டிவ் பண்ற மாதிரி அவங்க வந்து பாத்தீங்கன்னா அவங்க ட்விட்டர்ல பாத்தீங்கன்னா அவங்க அவங்க வந்து ரொம்ப ஒரு நான் அது போட்டிருக்கேன் சேட்ல பாத்தீங்கன்னா தெரியும் அவங்க வந்து சயின்ஸ்ல ஒரு ரொம்ப ஆர்வமும் உற்சாகமும் கொண்டு வேலை செய்வோம் இப்போ இந்த ஜாம் சொன்ன மாதிரி ராமானுஜம் சொன்ன மாதிரி இந்த இந்தியன் சயின்டிஸ்ட் ரெஸ்பான்ஸ் டு கொரோனா வைரஸ் ஒரு குரூப் அவங்களும் இருக்காங்க அவங்க முக்கியமா பங்கு இருக்காங்க அவங்க அதுல மூலமா இந்த கொரோனா பத்தி மக்களிடம் எல்லோரிடமும் கோவிட்டை பத்தி என்ன தவறான கருத்துகள் இருக்கு எது சரியான கருத்து அப்படின்னு எடுத்துக்கு போறதுல நிறைய பங்கு இருக்கு அவங்க நிறைய ட்விட்டர் சேட்ல வெயி இதுலயும் நிறைய வேலை செய்யறாங்க அவங்க பிஎஸ்சி எம்எஸ்சி வந்து மகாராஜா சிவாஜி ராவ் யூனிவர்சிட்டில படிச்சுட்டு அப்புறம் பிஹெச்டி வந்து பிராண்டேஜ் யூனிவர்சிட்டி யூஎஸ்ஏல பண்ணாங்க அத செஞ்சுட்டு அப்புறம் அவங்க போஸ்ட் டாக்டர் ஒர்க் பண்ணிட்டு இங்க வந்து முத என்சிபிஎஸ் பேங்களூர்ல போய் நாலு வேலைக்கு வந்தாங்க அப்புறம் இப்போ டிஎஃப்ஆர் ல ஒரு அசோசியேட் ப்ரொஃபஸரா இருக்காங்க அவங்க லேப் வந்து ரொம்ப ஒரு அங்க அவங்களுக்கு முக்கிய மாணவர்கள் மாணவிகளை ரொம்ப நன்றாக அவங்க கூட ஃப்ரெண்ட்ஸ் மாதிரி சேர்த்து பழகக்கூடிய ஒரு அம்சம் இருக்கிறது அவங்கள நமக்கு நிறைய கூட இருக்காங்க கேள்விகள் நிறைய அவங்களுக்கு தமிழ் புரியும் அதனால அவங்க தமிழ கேள்வி கேட்டாலும் அதுக்கு பதில் வந்து சொல்றதுக்கு பார்ப்பாங்க அதனால ஆன் பிஹாஃப் ஆஃப் தமிழ்நாடு சயின்ஸ் புரம் அண்ட் பாப்புலர் சயின்ஸ் லெக்சர்ஸ் I am pleased to in, uh, have introduced uh, Dr. Sandhya Koshika and uh, request her to start her talk. Thank you, Sandhya. Thank you. You are muted. Sandhya is muted. Thank you. Uh, I am doing a screen share. I am doing a screen share. இந்த டாக் நான் இங்கிலீஷ்ல தான் கொடுக்கணும் எனக்கு அவ்வளவு நன்னா தெரியுது தமிழ் எஸ்பெஷலி சயின்ஸ் இன் தமிழ் பேச தெரியாது பட் உங்களுக்கு கொஸ்டின்ஸ் தமிழ்ல கேட்கணும்னா பிளீஸ் ஃபீல் ஃப்ரீ டு டூ தட் ஐ ஐ வில் டூ மை பெஸ்ட் டு ரிப்ளை இன் தமிழ் அட் திஸ் பாயிண்ட் we stand at what i consider to be a very crucial juncture in the covid-19 pandemic this has been there pone january aranjathu 
we the sequence was actually put out by this uh, time uh, by china december le you had the uh, you know respiratory syndrome and so we have known since a whole year what the bug was what the virus was that it was a coronavirus it was similar to sars and mers which some years ago caused lot of people to die because they were they had very bad outcomes when they infected human beings and at this point this is the data that i took from world o meter this morning and you can see world over there are a large number of people who have been affected lot of deaths and even in india we have about 1.5 lakh deaths which is not small it may not be as large as you are seeing in certain other countries but it is still not small however there is of course if you look at the entire population level of india there is some good news the number of daily cases seems to be going down and the number of deaths is also going down despite this i would say the time has not come for becoming complacent we still have a large fraction of our population if you even believe this number we still have a large popular fraction of the population who have probably not yet got the disease and and therefore if they get the disease could have bad outcomes we still do not know if a person who gets a disease whether they are old whether they are young what the outcome will be at an individual level no repair why sanavar the if they get coronavirus there will be much greater number of people who will die but for a given individual we still don't have that prediction so we have seen i think many of us have experience of knowing young people who have passed away uh, in coronavirus you know we've seen young people who have had severe hospitalization and bad outcomes and if you just look at what information is out there we also see that people who recover have long covid symptoms where they take they have symptoms of lack of sleep fatigue seems to be fairly common and some of these are also common for other viral diseases but because such a large number of people have been affected we see these as significant percentages of the population what was the control strategies that as nations have faced this pandemic put in place the first and foremost has uh, always has been mitigation and this sort of mitigation approaches are old approaches these are not you know particularly novel approaches but these approaches have been around from the time of the flu and essentially it is wear masks to reduce uh, you know uh, respiratory particles from leaving your mouth and nose and you know lingering in the air and infecting other people maintain distance because even with wearing most of us will probably wear cloth masks there will be some leak there will be some spread so if you maintain distance you reduce the chance of acquiring the disease you of course maintain hand hygiene and if you indoors try to choose well ventilated places as you see all of these mitigation effects have really upended people's lives and the economy and are very difficult to implement consistently on the ground if you go anywhere and i work in tifr and we have a lot of students who wear masks and you tell them to physically distance they're all wearing masks but they'll all be standing next to each other because that's you know that's the natural way we interact the other approach which has been done with some better success in other countries and is of course difficult to implement and difficult uh, and expensive in public health system is a is the approach of containment where you have you know one person who's infected you try you once you've tested them and you know that they are infected you trace all their contacts and you isolate all relevant people 
again difficult to do especially in uh, people who have you know the breadwinner of the family has to be isolated it's very difficult money needs to come in and even in better uh, well to do families it's not a given that they will have space the ability there is fear that the government will put them somewhere and these have all sort of uh, made it difficult as a public health measure to do at least in india and in many parts of the world as well it's just not unique to india so then all the hopes of our of the you know humans on the planet was we will get wonderful treatment strategies and everything is going to be fine we will have medicine and then whether we get covid or not we will not end up in some ventilator we can manage it and we'll be okay and there was a lot of interest in many types of medicines and there was you know you must have heard the noise which came for remdesivir hydroxychloroquine and the only single drug which sort of stood the test and had robust data supporting its use was dexamethasone or other steroid and of course with time i think doctors recognize the disease and manage it better but there wasn't a whole lot there isn't there isn't a magic bullet we don't have something to the equivalent of penicillin for world war 2 soldiers or you know post world war 2 when people needed to fight off bacterial diseases we don't have that magic bullet so after the fatigue which comes with dealing with all of these our hopes were all set up and you know built up on vaccines saying vaccines are going to solve the problem after the vaccines life will come back to normal and i think one thing that we probably all recognize by looking at the news it's a confusing picture and for the lay public which i hope some of you are in just science enthusiasts you recognize how difficult it is to explain this information to other people and to present the information which is which is available in a manner which assists people in making good choices for themselves when the epidemic start when the epidemic started and when the pandemic started there were hopes pinned on vaccines but everybody said it would take a really really long time to start to get into picture maybe up to 2 years now at least in india lockdown was in march about 9 to 10 months later we are at a place where we are considering what vaccine to use so i thought what i would do for the rest of the talk was to just go through in a very in a very general manner uh, about what are vaccines what approaches and technologies have been used for the covid-19 vaccines and what considerations we as the general public should be thinking about and should be aware of when we look at vaccines okay the basis of a vaccine is how our immune system reacts to any bug right that's what our immune system has evolved to do to fight off bug so the coronavirus which you must buy now every single person can probably draw it in their sleep is a little virus which has on its surface something called the spike protein this spike protein binds to a receptor on a cell gets internalized obviously first in your respiratory passages and nose and then travels down to your lungs it can obviously infect lot of different tissues including your capillaries and because this receptor is to receptors present in lots of places but essentially when the virus enters a cell it can make copies of itself it can make just make more of itself it's spit out from the cell that is taken up by an antigen presenting cell it chops up the virus into little bits and presents it on the surface and then you trigger cell or humoral based immunity where you have both the b cell which make antibodies and the t cells which can destroy individual cells most of us would have heard about the serology test which tries to see whether you have antibodies against coronavirus and essentially what it is testing for is has your cell produced these antibodies against the coronavirus and are those antibodies floating around in your blood stream 
So you have one arm which is antibody based and a second arm which is cell based which can recognize individual cells which are infected and eat them up. So far in all studies that have been done, we know that if you have an antibody response as is shown in this picture, that is very critical for protection. Nobody yet knows if a T cell response alone seems to be sufficient. And the reason I'm mentioning it here is for the few aficionados who may there be there in the audience, it appears that the T cell arm of the endogenous response or the body's response to coronavirus seems to be an important means, uh, important immune activation that we observe. So we still do not know how important it is for us as humans to fight off coronavirus. So with that little bit of science, and I'll go down to the next slide. What happens with a vaccine? A vaccine is generally a way to artificially, without the virus being present, without SARS-CoV-2 present or the COVID-19 virus being present, to activate this entire pathway by using small bits of that virus or big bits of that virus, and we'll come to that, um, into the system, okay? So you take the vaccine, which contains preservatives, emulsifiers, stabilizers, and I'll come back to why those things are important when you think about safety. Combine it with something which is called adjuvant, which improves the immunogenicity. That is, it improves how good of an immune response you will get and inject it into the animal, either under the skin or into the muscle or some version of that. Some of them like oral polio vaccines, you take them orally, but in, in the SARS-CoV-2, that's, that, that's not the approach any of the manufacturing arms are taking. And this triggers the immune system. It triggers it such that you have both T cells as well as B cells. B cells make the immune, immune uh, uh, the antibodies and the T cells assist the B cells making antibodies as well as kill cells which are infected with the virus or in this case, this little bits of protein. And they both, B and T cells, form memory cells which are present for years. And that's in, that's in fact, that's in fact, in fact, the baby memory cells, long lived memory cells are what allow us to fight off uh, any pathogen for which we got vaccinated maybe 20 years ago, because those memory cells are still present. Okay. There are many types of vaccine technology. And I think this is a very useful slide because the first thing I'm going to point out is smallpox. You take weakened or attenuated vaccines or inactivated vaccines, it doesn't matter. And you sort of in you sort of expose the body to it. So the because you have killed the and uh, killed the bug in some form or fashion, um, it cannot give you an active virus, uh, active disease, or it can give you a very mild disease. And this has been used for centuries now. Either the killed whole organisms or the attenuated. These have both been used for centuries. There are other approaches like using against a particular toxin or you use a part of the protein, a part of the uh, pathogen which is maybe present on the surface and you use just one or two of the proteins. And in fact, in a sense, that's what we are using now. You make virus-like particles, which there is nothing right now with phase three using that technology, but there is even a company in India, Premas Biotech, which is trying to develop that technology. And there are other things like you can have a viral vector where you put a little bit of the nucleic acid or the DNA, which can code for a part of the virus to uh, generate immune system. Or what we have is nucleic acid vaccine. In this case, with respect to uh, the COP2, we have uh, the Moderna and Pfizer um, vaccines, which are basically mRNA vaccines. So there are multiple technologies which have been used. Some are centuries old. Some, like the viral vector, are more recent, like the viral vector vaccine was developed for Ebola. It was also developed for Rift Valley uh, disease, which is an animal disease. So we know a lot about certain types of technologies. But for instance, the mRNA vaccine is a new technology, which has hitherto never been used in public vaccination campaigns. I think we all need to take a step back and 
sort of take a call and recognize that vaccines work and they have impact. When you say vaccines work, this is the absolutely beautiful picture which has come from this, uh, uh, from the science magazine. Many people, and I, I heard this just a day or two ago, when someone went around and say, isn't it true that having public hygiene and bathrooms was the biggest improvement and we didn't, you know, for public health compared to vaccines? Let's take one example here. Let's look at chickenpox. You had certain amount. This is data, by the way, coming up only from the US, but still very, very useful to look at. The size of the circle is the number of people who get infected. Okay. And here in 1970, starting 1970, data has been collected. Here's the chickenpox vaccine when it becomes part of childhood vaccination and number of people who get infected really, really drops down, right? So it's just not hygiene. Vaccines actually make sure that the number of people falling ill due to communicable diseases is much lower than it would be otherwise. And this has tremendous value in making sure children are healthy, they can go to school, adults don't need to take off time. People who had chickenpox as a child and have seen other people suffer due to shingles, you have a shingles vaccine, you can avoid the elderly people having terrible uh, attacks of shingles. So there are many good things that have come out of it, out of using these vaccine campaigns. And it's always useful to look at data to take a call on recognizing that it's just not improvement in public hygiene, but vaccines themselves provide great benefit and have tremendous impact on the life of people. When you can see data like that, what becomes very clear is vaccine safety is a very, very important factor that we all need to consider. The reason we need to consider that is because vaccines are given to healthy people. Medicines and other things that we do are given to sick people. So, you know, we know they're sick, they will have some negative outcome and you're trying to mitigate it or reduce it. When vaccines are given to healthy people, you can't have healthy people becoming sick because of the vaccine. That would completely defeat the purpose. Therefore, the vaccine not only need to not destroy the health of the individual, but they need to have high efficacy. And we'll hear this word again as I come to it. That efficacy is a term which is used to determine how many people are protected in a controlled clinical trial, which is different from effectiveness, which is how it behaves on the ground. Vaccines are also given to a wide range of people of varied health and ages. You give it to children, you give it to older people. In fact, we need to expand vaccines given to older people is a case made by several public health um, uh, officials and doctors. You also have people who have different kinds of diseases are on different kinds of medication. So since it's given to a wide range of people, we have to make sure that it is actually tolerated well and continues to give the outcomes that one hopes for. The next thing is it's not a one-time dose. Everybody knows when they have to take their children or other people for giving booster doses, multiple doses are given. So you're getting exposed to it more than once. It's not one-off. So you have to be really sure that you're doing the right thing. And everything matters, not only the science, but the quality of the production, the distribution, the storage, as well as the ease of administration. In fact, when WHO approves a vaccine, they look at the science, which is preclinical information, which is without which no company would take it on to the clinical steps anyway. But they look at all the clinical uh, information from all the phases of the trials, and I'll just come to that. They also look at quality of production before they say, yes, this vaccine is approved. So currently for SARS-CoV-2, WHO, as of this Wednesday, when I sat through one of their press briefings, only one, uh, the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine has been approved by WHO. The reason to do all this is that the many people have vaccine hesitancy aside from making sure that people are you know we do not destroy the health of anybody and we really you know are doing the right thing for large numbers of people people also have vaccine hesitancy therefore vaccines must work as advertised 
Okay, so I think these are the many reasons why um, people who are in this area of research don't rush through the steps because overall long term for public good, you need to have a robust process where multiple arms can be independently assessed and you can have good outcomes for the greatest number of people. Okay. So what about coronavirus? I sort of listed a few technologies and if you could see that table, which was almost unreadable. In fact, uh, my daughter looked at it and she said, you should split it into two. I said, I don't have time to do that. But here is a picture which comes from the New York Times. And for, uh, uh, for the SARS-CoV-2, um, the vaccine platforms and technologies being used are the whole virus vaccines, which are either inactivated or live attenuated. The inactivated is the Bharat Biotech platform. That's what is also being done by one of the vi vi vaccines, which is coming out of China, which uh, China has already started using. And trial data for that has come from both Turkey as well as Brazil, and there's some debate about how much of it is made public, but nonetheless, there's some information. Uh, and the live attenuated, which in India is being done by Codagenics. The genetic vaccines, almost everybody has heard of the mRNA vaccine, uh, which comes from both Moderna and Pfizer, and they were the first ones uh, off the block in terms of being used for public vaccination. The viral vector vaccines, in which essentially you use a platform of adenovirus, which is very safe. We get adenovirus mediated cold. So, but these are not necessarily from humans, but have a long history of use. And it's based on both from Russia. Uh, as well as as well as from the Jenner Institute in Oxford, which then partnered with AstraZeneca and Serum Institute to build up uh, production and do all the testing. We also have virus-like particles being made. Uh, none of these as yet in phase three trials uh, because this is much harder. But the bet that some of the companies are taking is that you know instead of depending on just the spike protein, and by the way, this red sticky thing which is sticking out is a spike protein through which it enters uh, enters uh, a human cells. But to have these kind of virus particles might allow you to have a slightly different trigger for your immune system and maybe better in some ways because it will be mimicking much more what the virus is like without having any of the dangers of so having a live attenuated vaccine. For instance, live attenuated vaccines can sometimes cause disease and it has that's known especially for polio that you can have reversion and that can occur okay so in terms of safety this might combine the strengths of using uh, a whole virus vaccine without the problems of using at least a live attenuated version of whole vaccine and then there are you know you can make bits of the protein the subunit vaccines and then inject that protein into humans and see what happens I'm going to show you this, what I consider a very nice picture from uh, actually Al Jazeera. And I think there are some news outlets um, like New York Times, The Atlantic, and some articles which I actually found yesterday in Today and Al Jazeera, which have done a very good job of collating some of the information. And here it is again. The RNA vaccine will be made typically against only one protein. And here what we are having, uh, what the examples we have is against the spike uh, protein. And virus-like particles is technology which we have used, especially for human papillomavirus and hepatitis vaccines, but is now, as I said, not even in uh, phase three trials. The protein subunit vaccines is that it can be used on any one small subunit of the protein can be used for anyone and it has the least adverse least amount of known adverse effects but the effects over here is that you will need multiple shots to boost your immune system uh, really well okay as i've emphasized the safety is very important but the other pillar of vaccines is efficacy right so when you think about safety you have preclinical tests where you target a particular, you say we're going to make the vaccine using this particular protein or these particular groups of protein. 
or the whole inactivated virus. So you do your preclinical studies, sometimes using cells in cultures, and then go on to you know animal studies. Um, and then you make this big step if those early uh, things work and you have an immune response and it doesn't appear as if those cells are uh, have you know facing bad consequences. I will mention briefly these things. I'm not putting a lot of science in, in any of my slides. You go through what is actually a part of regime to assess if the vaccine that you are developing is both safe and efficacious or works essentially. In phase one, all you do is take about a hundred healthy volunteers. They usually be young, you know, for COVID-19, they're obviously going to be uh, who don't have any other health issues. And then you inject them with whatever is your dosing regime that you think might work based on prior information and then see if they have any adverse outcome. That's really small number of people. I think in just our own personal experience, we will often see that for certain medicines or certain kinds of things, some people respond better than others to the same kind of treatment regimes. Likewise with vaccines, there's an enormous diversity in human populations and there are differences in immune response. Some of these are being very beautifully illustrated by studies how humans respond to COVID-19, uh, response to the SARS pre-exists, all right? So then you come to phase two, which is a larger safety trial. So if you don't see any serious side effects and uh, for the doses that you're providing, then you go to phase two and say, okay, when you look at up to a thousand people, usually you don't go above a thousand here. And these kinds of uh, trials are also done when you have licensure in India, licensure is done in some other country, but you bring it into India and want to use it for Indian, uh, for Indian populations. So far, the Indian government uh, regulatory authorities have always asked for a bridging study of about a thousand or two thousand people just to make sure that, you know, how it works elsewhere where it was licensed. Is the same that it was in India. But maybe, you know, you have a larger number of people, so you have slightly better understanding of what might be other kinds of adverse effects. And you take an assessment of if there is immunogenicity. Do that also in phase two. That is, is there a response for the um, injections that you're giving uh, of whatever platform that you're using? And I will come back to these two points when I give you examples as to how vaccines, even for SARS-CoV-2, a couple of them had to be excluded in these early phases. Okay? And then you have phase three, which is the time where you can actually decide if you have efficacy to ask if it actually works. Okay? And the way this is done is you divide, you have usually about 25 to 30,000 people. It depends on how common the disease is, whether you can get a volunteer. You need two arms, you need a control arm, and which is or the placebo arm, and you need your vaccine arm. And you need, you need to prepare sites for this where you know that the disease is there in the population and these people will face it, but the prevalence is slightly low. And then you expect that a higher prevalence will occur over there. And then you collect data and you see how many people in the control arm got the disease, how bad was the outcome for the disease, and how many people in the trial arm got the disease and how bad were their outcome. And looking at these two numbers is how you calculate your percentage efficacy. That's not the end. Safety is something which is monitored all the time for quite a while. Okay, The phase four post-licensing safety is often done when you have the vaccine being provided as a public health instrument. And a lot of people are getting vaccinated. And then you see, okay, what fraction of these, you know, now it's tens of thousands of people are responding because this is even greater diversity. So really rare events will also be something that you will see. So these four phases, post-licensing, including post-licensing, are what determine safety and of which efficacy is primarily determined in looking at phase three.
although there are observational studies done even at phase four, and that is usually to assess effectiveness. Okay, how do you decide a vaccine is safe? There have been cases when you inject a particular antigen, that's what it's called here, the spike protein would be an antigen or a whole inactivated virus, the whole inactivated virus is acting like an antigen. We have known cases, most important of those, or most commonly understood of those is the respiratory syncytial virus, where the vaccine itself causes when you get you get you get the vaccine and then you get the disease, you have a massive overreaction, not overreaction, massive response from uh, the immune system, which gives you worse outcomes than if you just got the disease. And that's a very, very dangerous outcome that uh, in cell based assay, this is called um, I won't go into the details, this vaccine dependent response was not seen with SARS and currently is not an issue for SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Let me emphasize this is not considered an issue, but you can also have unintended consequences. Some of you might have read in the news, the uh, Australian vaccine with CSL, they had to stop the trials because in the backbone, there was a small fragment of the HIV protein and volunteers developed an immune response against that fragment of the HIV protein. They did not get AIDS. They did not get infected with HIV. But because they developed unintentionally, this is something that the developers did not anticipate, antibodies against this, this could actually lead to problems that if any of them got HIV, they already have pre-circulating antibodies against HIV, or if they thought they didn't, you know, you, they went saying, I'm worried about this, they may test positive. So this unintended consequences, it had to be stopped. That trial had to be stopped, even though they had an immunogenic response in, um, in people. Side effects, I think every person who's been a parent or a child knows the side effects of vaccine. You get fever, you get local swelling, you get headaches. Those are mild effects. You can have adverse effects, genuinely adverse effects, both short term, late onset and rare. And if anybody gets a handle on the leaflet which goes with vaccines, they are often listed and in what percentages. And those have to be very, very low. Right, because you want to think about it in numbers. If it's 1%, it is too high. It's usually extremely low. And of course, it is balanced by the, um, um, balanced by the cost of having the diseases there for the individual and for the population. You need info on background rates of adverse effects, right? So if you're seeing that someone is having difficulty walking after taking a vaccine because of some neurological symptoms, and some, I, some of you might have realized might recall that there was a news article a while ago that the AstraZeneca trial had been paused for a while because there were some adverse effects. Those were neurological effects. You need to know what is the general, you know, if you were, had no vaccine in the population, what is the background rate in which such uh, symptoms would be seen? And is it more over here? Is it coming in a vaccine unrelated manner? So you have to look at all the data and then take a call. The other thing is new technologies and vehicles for delivery. I said, right, when you have a vaccine, you have emulsifiers, you have stabilizers, people are trying newer adjuvants, which can prime the immune system better. The very, very old adjuvant is still very going strong, which is alum. Uh, but newer adjuvants are being developed, perhaps not quite at the rate that you would like. So each of these elements you need to be sure is not going to cause any sort of side effect or adverse effect for the individual who receives it. The mRNA technology has hitherto never been used. It's the first time it's being used. So obviously people were worried about the fact that it was going to be in a lipid coat. And in fact, the recommendation is people who have severe allergies not use that platform, but use a different kind of vaccine. So you see, it's not as simple as saying, today we have a vaccine, this vaccine is right for everybody and let's just roll it out. There are many considerations that go into thinking in terms of what is safe for a vaccine. The next and more important question is, after you've dealt with your safety issues, does a vaccine work? The first and foremost is, can it elicit an immune response? Is your body responding to it? Maybe it's never, you're not even going to respond to it. And this is assessed both in the preclinical stage and animal model and in your clinical studies, phase one, specifically phase two. 
Sanofi GSK, many people bet on it. And they said it's going to be a great platform. It's a good company. They have experience. Let's go ahead and look at that. They had to halt and abandon it because in their phase two trials, they did not get sufficient immune response for the dose that they injected. Right? So then you can't say, ah, I'll do another dose and it'll be fine. No, you have to test that too because you don't know that the higher dose is necessarily going to give you the immune response that you want. So this can happen. This was against the COVID-19. Uh, this is against SARS-CoV-2. So you know, this, these are the real situations that vaccine developers, be they scientists or scientists working in uh, companies have to face or clinicians. Is the immune response protected? And this is extremely important and it's not easy to do. Just because you get an immune response, that doesn't mean that it's going to protect you against the disease, right? And so one of the challenges has been, what are the correlates of protection? How will you measure that the immune response that a person is getting when they're injected with a vaccine is actually going to protect you? Good news with SARS-CoV-2, we now have animal-based and human cell studies, which have all been coming out just this month, um, which suggests that there's something called neutralizing antibodies, which prevent or block the entry of the virus into human cells. Okay, so now we have tests to do in other systems other than humans, other than asking, we got the vaccine, now let us see if there's a vaccine, uh, virus circulating, are we going to get it, right? So this correlate of protection was a very hard one, um, uh, hard one to get. I mean, as you see, your vaccine and your correlate of protection have come more or less at the same time. And in fact, there, some of you may be aware about the use, there was a lot of uh, talk about using convalescent sera, that is people who have recovered, you can use their sera because they'll have antibodies against um, SARS-CoV-2 and you give it to people who are sick and then it might, uh, you know, prevent, might help them in getting better sooner. What resulted from looking at everybody's different antibody type, antibodies, like each individual was uh, making, everybody made different amounts of neutralizing antibodies. But a vaccine cannot say each person will not make neutralizing antibodies. We have to know that every vaccine that is provided will actually make neutralizing antibodies of some sort. And that this is the correct thing to look at. So it took time to work through that detail and to know that neutralizing antibodies are currently the best correlate of protection. And they appear to be assays which actually allow you to uh, make that conclusion with some confidence. The next thing, as I said repeatedly, is how much does it protect? If it protects only 30% of the cases, we don't know. The bar that was set for COVID-19 vaccines, at least in some places in the world, was it should at least protect 50%. And if you remember, the Pfizer uh, vaccine when it first came out with this two dose regime the first set of doses was when they were given about you know three weeks apart uh three three to four weeks apart uh gave only around 60 percent protection but when it was given at a smaller dose in the beginning and a larger dose later it seemed to give you over 90 percent protection and that's how they come up with an average of 70 percent and the most important thing, finally, is how well does it protect in regular use? Because now you're going to see a, the widest variety of people taking it. And that's where you call it effectiveness. And you measure effectiveness by doing observational studies, not these kind of control studies where one arm doesn't, you know, gets uh, basically placebo and the other arm gets the thing. And then you make these kind of in, internal controls. But instead, here you say, OK, let's give it and let's see how effective effective we are on the ground okay so that's how you take a call on does a vaccine work because so far we have not done human challenge trials for SARS-CoV-2 or most other vaccines so we are not directly challenging works and one of the reasons the human challenge
trials. People have, several people, not all, have consistently stood against it. Some have not, and there are people who have been willing to volunteer for it. And there is talk that the UK is going to just start some amount of human challenge trials. Is essentially if you have a disease whose outcome cannot be predicted, that you have some number of people who could lose their lives, and you you know you are in the wild west there, you don't know what the outcome will be. Those are not the approaches to take. So we have to take indirect measures to determine efficacy, and later on when it's licensed and use effectiveness. And that's why there has been a lot of emphasis on determining efficacy and doing the clinical trials appropriately. Okay. Here's another question which comes routinely. Everybody says you will take years, sometimes decades to get a vaccine. How did we get the COVID-19 vaccine so quickly? Was something done which was, you know, maybe some Hera fairy was done, some Ural is there somewhere? And the answer is absolutely not. Several of the technologies that are used are already well established. Because of MERS and SARS, which are very similar viruses, there was a huge head start one had. Because you knew that the spike was likely how the virus, this group of viruses was getting into human cells. So you knew that you could target that. And also using certain platforms, people had tried to develop, uh, you know, halfway, partway. They had done the control studies. They knew the adenovirus platform, which is used by AstraZeneca. Um, is well tolerated there are no bad effects all those control information that you know it could be given safely to humans were that information was under our belt some of the preclinical and clinical efforts ran concurrently so the first phase as well as the preclinical studies where you're doing 100 people can run concurrently money it's a huge public health problem the whole world is appended there's no part it's a maybe you can see New Zealand is doing really well and maybe a few countries here and there. Money is needed for all of these steps. For many vaccine developments, you have long gaps between things because it's not a huge public health necessity. So you don't have the kind of funding that you need. Companies as well as regulatory, government regulatory agencies work, uh, agencies worked with great urgency and production cap capacities were ramped up before efficacy was now. Tony Fauci, there was this big meeting arranged um, by, by the Indian government where Tony Fauci came and uh, spoke. And he said very clearly at that time, we are willing to take the risk. We have ramped up production of things that we think might work and we have kept it ready. Serum Institute has done the same with the AstraZeneca uh, tire in production. They have, so production capacities were very important and were ramped up. And the very good news is that many people were willing to volunteer for these back-to-back -back trials because without having enough people volunteering for trials, you will not be able to get the data which gives you confidence that this vaccine is going to work. And there were many people in this world who volunteered for these trials for very, very little return. In in most cases beyond doing what might be thought for public good. Some, for some vaccine candidates, every step of the clinical trial path was followed and the data or interim data in many cases was available for independent review. What that allows you to do, especially in what is a crisis situation all across the world, is it gives confidence to the population that the right things have been done by and looked at carefully, and we can now take this product as a vaccine and have the expected outcome. And this is a very, very important step, especially as vaccine hesitancy is certainly a very real phenomenon in India and as well as in other parts of the world. So there are many major vaccine initiatives. I just wanted to show this. It's not something that I'm going to go through. Uh, of course, many people would have heard about Operation Warp Speed, but the other major which comes from the US uh, government, but I, I would like to highlight COVAX, which is part of the World Health Organization Act Accelerator, which is being spearheaded by CEPI and Gavi and Vaccine Alliance. And it is essentially a way to bring vaccines, to evaluate as well as bring vaccines not to a few countries, but to as many countries that need it, because otherwise the poorer countries will be just completely left out. Of course, India in this situation is in a very enviable position 
because the vast majority of the world's vaccine manufacturing actually takes place in India and we have a very, very strong industry which can deliver on this. And we are already seeing uh, some of the benefits of it with uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine being developed, but many, many other vaccines in the pipeline in the country. Okay. Here are vaccines that are approved in at least one country. This is a changing scenario, uh, game and you know more will get updated with time. And you can find this information at this link. It's a really, really nice website. I urge you to do that. As you see, the biggest um, spread has been for Pfizer BioNTech, um, which is a multinational, which is the mRNA-based vaccine. And this is brand new technology, never been used before in such large numbers. So I think, you know, if, if it's well tolerated, which is the expectations from all the data which is out there, that would be very good. Likewise is Moderna, which is a smaller country and has been approved in some places. Sinovac, which is the inactivated virus, uh, vaccine uh, from China, uh, and which is now the trials were done in Brazil and Turkey. Uh, and our very own Covaxin, which is similar, which is inactivated vaccine, but there isn't information yet on what the adjuvant was used. The alum adjuvant is a very old adjuvant, and there are a few others mostly in a handful of countries which have been used. Okay, So the major players in this market, aside from uh, multinationals, the US uh, is China, Russia, and India. And I think many of us recognize that vaccines are extremely important for public health. But this has also been a time where people have been worrying about their populations, their populations and economic activities in their country. But it has been closely linked with how they think about themselves and their national identities. It sort of complicates um, some of the necessary steps before uh, vaccines come out into use, which is purely a scientific and clinical question. Okay, but this is not the end. And this is from WHO. They have this... Uh, they have this wonderful data that they update twice a week, uh, which anybody is publicly accessible. Anybody can look at it. There are many, many, you know, 172 vaccines in preclinical development. So you're looking at things which are happening in cells and in animals. They're not in humans. There are 63 vaccines in clinical trials. There are 15 in phase three trials. WHO, as I said earlier, has only approved one, which is the uh, Pfizer BioNTech. And they come in various categories. There's the RNA vaccine, there is the protein subunit vaccine, there's the inactivated vaccine, you know, so there's a large number of these present. Other important issues with vaccine, what is the dosage and what is the route of administration? And there is a lot of uh, discussion around it. Most recently, the Pfizer, uh, sorry, AstraZeneca head said that when they separate you know, you already heard about the AstraZeneca, they offered the half dose by mistake, and then they followed up with a full dose and you got 90% protection. Usually when you have, you set your clinical trial parameters in advance, you say, what is the outcome for the parameters you set? This was just something that happened by the by, so you would need independent investigation. Nonetheless, one can treat that as interim data. Apparently, there is data which will soon be out in the public domain, which says that if they wait for a much longer time between the first and the second dose, you have greater efficacy. So you see, why does this matter? Why does it matter how many doses and when these doses are given and how far apart? You intrinsically linked, we are, we are in a planet in need of this vaccine. There are many, many people who need this vaccine and we are not sure how many doses we have. So, you know, do we mix and match doses? And many of these are not recommended as yet. So if you take the Pfizer as the first dose, or you take uh, the AstraZeneca Serum Institute COVID Shield as the first dose, the expectation is that the second dose will also be from the same company because that's what you have data for. But all of these I'm hearing are going to be part of public uh, clinical trials to see how far can you push it? Can you do this cross stimulation with different vaccine platforms? Will you get the same kind of effect? Will these trials be done in small numbers? I do not know, but these are real concerns that people have. And absolutely, this is going to depend on availability. So here you can see 
that um, there are, there, you know, only 11 candidate vaccines are going to go with one dose. A vast majority of them, 38, which is 60%, are going to need two doses. A small percentage of them uh, might have three doses. And this is, you know, most of the doses are going to be within a month, right? So that's essentially what the data we have so far, unless the data becomes public about the AstraZeneca virus and having you know, three months gap between the first and second day. You should also see what, what I mentioned is that, you know, this vaccine has become much more complicated than just, or more complex than just a scientific and clinical problem. It has access issues, which is very, very important that people need to think about. And you see many, many countries have pre-ordered vaccines, including India. And RDIF is a Russian sovereign fund, which has partnered uh, to bring the best of Russian technology uh, and other issues to the world at large. So I would say that's probably the Sputnik V vaccine is what you can expect from that uh, case. But what I will show you is something that what are kinds of bets countries are making. There's the Sanofi GF. A GSK bet, which I already told you that was stopped because there wasn't sufficient immunogenicity. And the number of vaccines that were booked by EU partners was 300 million. That's just completely out of question now. Here's another with 100 million. So they can have huge consequences. And it's only these extremely wealthy countries with uh, EU, the US, Japan, and UK are choosing the mRNA vaccines because it's movement, it's transport, requires extremely cold temperatures, which is difficult to achieve. And in fact, even in places, you know, if you say the in US, not every place is going to have a minus 80 freezer or a minus 20 freezer, which is super reliable or even available. So some of these, one of these uh, vaccines is able to last for some, some days at, uh, you know, at four degrees and still have some effectiveness. But now you see where efficacy and effectiveness vary. What happens if you have a minus 80 vaccine sitting at four degrees for four days, it will, will it still act to give you 94% efficacy or is it going to drop to 70% or is it going to drop to 30%, right? These are all issues at hand, which is why those steps of efficacy need to be done well because that's your best case scenario and your effectiveness is going to probably be somewhat lower. Okay, or typically is somewhat lower. I told you about the large number of vaccines that are still in the pipeline. There are only about 13 or 14 which are in phase three. There are 63 in all in the clinical pipeline. So many are there. What is, you know, what's the point? Why do we have them? The need is high. Two to three companies may not be able to supply in a short time. I already discussed um, what are the issues with, you know, are we going to have single doses? Will we have, if somebody took the first dose, will they have a second dose available at the right time or will that not be there? Temperature, which I already highlighted with the mRNA vaccines, you need this extreme cold stability, distribution, can we even distribute something like that? A minus 80 vaccine would be very, very difficult to um, uh, distribute effectively in low and middle income countries. Those may be very expensive vaccines, can we get cheaper products, which still works as well. Long term protection is something which we just do not know. Right? We just we're all saying vaccine, vaccine, vaccine. Is it going to be like the flu vaccine? The likelihood is probably not. The flu, the bug changes a lot from season to season. So every year you need an updated vaccine for a flu vaccine, which by the way, only protects 40 to 60%, but still is very useful, especially if it's targeted to the right group, which is the elderly and the vulnerable and et cetera. And as time goes on, updates will be needed. Many of you have heard about the UK and South Africa variants of the SARS-CoV-2. And although the currently the thought um, and some limited data, at least from the UK, um, variant is that these vaccines which are being made, they are to different parts of the spike protein. So we do not, uh, our body's immune response is 
uh, going to be broader against all parts of the spike proteins and a few mutations which are present in the United Kingdom uh, or possibly even the South Africa variants will not change the effectiveness of the vaccines. But at some point, updates will be needed. That could be the same pipeline. It could be a different kind of technology. And as time goes on, this is something that we all need to recognize. Clinical trials will get harder because people will want to take the vaccine, which is already there. In fact, when Pfizer and Moderna did their trials, once they knew it was effective, usually you let that run without looking at your uh, control arm and start vaccinating them. But that was something that they needed to consider because you cannot in this pandemic situation where individual outcomes can be quite bad. You don't want to be in a situation where you deny people uh, a way to protect themselves. So trials and enrollments in trials will get harder. And natural infections, what happens to people who have recovered from COVID. So far, what we know is um, in recent papers that came out this month, I think a few days ago, it appears that the, in, there is uh, there's a different rate of decay of antibody and T cell uh, T cell based, uh, which are against uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. But at eight months, there is still some response present. So the idea is that if you if the rare case that you do get a reinfection, your immune system is ready uh, and will be able to fight back. But we don't know the answer. Is it going to be there three years from now, five years from now? For SARS, the T cell response was present or T cells which could recognize SARS were present even 17 years later. Is it going to be the same for SARS-CoV-2? We don't know, we have to see. So lots of unanswered questions. I want to end with two last slides. Vaccines are not a magic bullet, and it's something that each of us needs to recognize. Vaccines protect against disease and not infection. And so you can get infected, but you may not end up in hospital. Now, will you now transmit the infection from yourself who are protected to someone who may not be? That's something we don't know. So I think in the short and medium term, even after the vaccine, we have to do the mitigation strategy. Containment, especially if you have newer variants, which are much more transmissible, like is suspected with the UK strain and the South Africa strain, uh, will continue. Treatment and the ability to fine tune treatment uh, will continue. But I do not know how many more drugs are actively in the pipeline. There don't seem to be huge numbers of them available. Um, vaccines. The other considerations, apart from the ones I have discussed, what gives you herd immunity? What is the minimum number of people who need to get the vaccine so we can break the change? But that's going to depend on the population. It's going to depend on the density of people. It's going to depend on the circulating strains and how infective they are. So there isn't one answer that fits all even here. It's because a large number of people are infected. Therefore, even though SARS-CoV-2 doesn't change much and it can proofread itself, still undergoes some change just because of mass numbers. What about vaccinating beyond priority groups? Who are the priority groups? And the current uh, suggestion is that we must vaccinate even recovered people because we don't know how long their natural immunity will last. Okay, so these are all considerations. Some of them are science questions. Some of them are public policy questions, which we do not have yet good answers for. So I would, I would uh, make the case that uh, you still need mitigation strategies and care and follow precautions, at least for some time to come, even if you do get the vaccine. In your interests, but more in the interests of the people whom you love and your family members around you, whom, who may not get the vaccine. Last cause, I think all of us at some point or the other have heard, I don't plan to take the vaccine. For a variety of reasons, I've list listed a few. Um, COVID-19 is not a dangerous disease. Possibly the mortality is low, but long COVID seems to be a real phenomenon where people have uh, symptoms for long after they recover. Individual outcome you cannot predict. Side effects and safety are real concerns, which is why doing proper clinical trials and having the data put out 
in a way which can be independently scrutinized is very important. People also think that if they take vaccines, it's a means to you know, reduce their ability to have children. This is why, again, safety trials are very important, which actually shows data saying that that is not the case and that's not a fear that is justified. There are other ideas that vaccines themselves can cause disease. The answer is no, at least not for SARS-CoV-2. As I said, there have been vaccine-induced worsening of symptoms, which is a real thing, but I think people are big, have, scientists have understood it, and those issues are not there for the co vaccines against COVID-19. The other fear is nucleic acid vaccines can change my DNA. Absolutely not. We are eating DNA every day when we eat our bananas and, you know, katrikas or whatever other vegetables. <laughs> they all have DNA. They all have RNA. And these are not going to change us in any material way. And of course, there is, of course the public health perspective of, you know, some people may not be able to afford it and they may not lie in priority case. Uh, this, but this is, comes under public policy and politics. And of course, those are important concerns. So I'll end with this. Thank you for your time and attention. And I hope I have sort of covered a lot of the questions that you have. I'm happy to take questions. Okay. Ajayan? Yeah. Can I read the question one by one or you can read the question in the chat box? Um, we, um, I, re I request the participant to um, put your questions in the chat box. If you want to interact with the speaker directly, you can raise your hand. We will enable your mic. Um, and we also put the feedback forms in the um, uh, link for the feedback form in the chat box. Please fill up the feedback form before you leave the meeting. So uh, let us uh, start with the... Uh, I just, I just, I appear to have, can I just quickly correct myself? I appear to have misspoken. Uh, it was the AstraZeneca vaccine, which had the half dose and then uh, a follow up full dose. And it was not the Pfizer. That was certainly an error on my part. And um, I, I just thought most of the vaccines have been tested in the age group of 18 to uh, 75. Vaccines have not yet been tested, at least one of the questions, have not yet been tested on younger children. I think some of them have been tested on 16 year old, but no matter what, the number of people who are above 60, very few people have been tested. Pregnant women have not been tested. And so these are all critical groups um, so currently, no vaccine will be given to pregnant women, especially if there's been suggestions that, you know, the uh, parts of the immune response or the virus itself can maybe uh, attack the placenta. So you want to be very, very safe. So likewise, the immunocompromised uh, people, you know, they, they, may, they will not be able to get these vaccines for now. Uh, immediately, I think because some of those tests are missing. So yes, there are gaps, but I think this is a race I think everybody wants to protect our frontline workers, be they doctors, nurses, cleaners, um, the police, and there are so many of them who are well deserving of protection. Uh, for people, I think I answered one of the questions, which is for people who have had uh, uh, people who have had the disease. Um, the recommendation is that they should get vaccinated, but if I think uh, if I were a person who had had corona and recovered, and of course there will be antibodies that you can do with a simple test against the spike protein, which is now publicly available, in fact, cost some rupees. Um, it's, uh, you know, I would take a step back and say, you know, there are people who have not had the disease and who are frontline workers or who are aged in some way and who have comorbidities, who are more deserving and probably need it much more than me. It's not a recommendation right now, but I think as a personal choice, that is a reasonable personal choice to me because it is likely that you have protection for some time, at least, uh, from your natural infection. Can I ask you a question? Yes, please. Ah, uh, just wanted to know, as from personal angle, how long you can wait uh, for the vaccine if you have already been tested positive and come out of it? You have been tested positive. Um, you know, come out of it 
how long you have to wait so we, or we, how long, uh, we don't have I, i want to say that we don't have clear data but our most recent study says at least eight months okay eight months right a most right. recent study which came out this uh-huh i heard month it. i'm not sure whether it was in it could be longer so but yeah. one can do a antibody test and from there you can go for whether you need the vaccine or not right well eventually even you sh- even a person who has recovered should get a vaccine is who's recommendation right now at least as per the wednesday uh, every wednesday they have any it's open to everybody by the way every wednesday they come and speak to the public and take questions that was their recommendation um that even be, because we just don't know how long natural immunity lasts you can look and sometimes your antibody levels will be very low and will not show up in your test which does not mean you don't have memory cells okay and cannot mount a response because do remember the t cells again sars were there for 17 years later so you have some form of immunity is it enough to fight off if you get a major infection um is not clear but also keep in mind when you're thinking about this is that the chance of reinfection seems pretty low we not getting many independent cases being reported there's an occasional case here or there but vast number of people have recovered and not gotten reinfected even though the virus is circulating in our population so i i would say that it's all right to let other more prior higher priority groups step in if you feel like it i think it would be perfectly acceptable now thank you i think this question is covered uh, the aditya verma so he is asking the similar question i uh, already tested positive for covid 19 one month back i met a developed antibody cell already which can be confirmed by antibody test if so whether i need to take the vaccine as for the serological studies done at various places in a sizable percentage of population have antibody already if such case is it not wise to give priority to the people other people initially i i would think that would be a reasonable way forward a sizable depends on which serology survey you look at uh there was a serology survey done in karnataka by two completely different groups and they came up with different numbers one was vastly higher than the rest but it is reasonable to say that uh, it cannot perhaps be taken as an approach by the government because how many serology tests will you do and then take a fall and um, perhaps the government may not take that approach i would not know what would be sensible uh, necessarily the most sensible approach here but i think when vaccine is a choice for you uh, if you are you know a person in the age group which is likely to have the best outcomes or don't have any comorbidities uh, and you have also recovered uh, from a disease without any sequelae i would i would be happy to wait in my own case i would be very happy to wait so next question so we got a question from the youtube dina dayal how dexamethasone and anti inflammatory drug used for covid uh how is it used i mean i think it it seems to work uh, in uh, people to sort of uh, really improve mortality that is far fewer people die is remdesivir what the study some of the studies seem to suggest is that it shortens ho- uh, hospital stay but does not have any effect and that is an antiviral dexamethasone i think the whole immune how it precise the act is not clear but one of the ways is a major uh effect of covid and seems to give rise to the variety some of the symptoms that come are not not related to the lungs it comes from other tissues and inflammation seems very key in uh, in in sort of the way the disease progresses and dexamethasone seems to control those effects and you know you know probably already that now uh, getting covid sometimes people get stroke and other kinds of things with nothing to do with the lungs and i think the biggest effects of dexamethasone and other steroids i think people in, in india use other steroids than dexamethasone which by the way is so cheap 
right? So, I mean, people were so excited because available all over the world, really cheap, uh, access is not a problem. People have a lot of information about its prior use, can bring down inflammation and can seriously reduce mortality, which is great. So next question from Aditya Verma. Um, whether vaccines developed so far effective for new variant? That's as I addressed that in my talk as well. It, it's, uh, the expectation is that it will be effective. Uh, I think um, we are still awaiting data in the public domain about that. Uh, and people are looking closely at the tests being done both in UK as well as South Africa. The UK variant, I think there's some preliminary data. But in just first principles, if you look at it, you have a little spike protein. Each of that will have antibodies against it in many parts, right? So even if you get a version which has a different, slightly different spike protein, it will have many different kinds of antibodies that your body already is primed to. So the expectation it will work. But of course, as the, as the pandemic continues to progress and more circulating strains comes, it might need a web update. So the flu vaccine gets a yearly update where you say, okay, what are the circulating strains? What's likely to hit? Now let's make the new version of the flu vaccine. So it might need one, but currently the expectation is that our virus uh, vaccines which have come out are expected to work against the UK variant and very likely the South African variant. We don't know yet, we don't have the data, but that's the expectation. So another question, uh, question from Aparna. These vaccines are for people above 18 years. Then what about the children and rest below 18 years? Currently, currently, um, currently, we can we cannot give these vaccines to children. I know it's a tremendous source of concern, especially the new A UK variant seems to be spreading in children and from children to adults, possibly higher than the older ones, and that might just be the transmissibility because it transmits uh, much greater. That is, you need probably fewer viral particles to get infected. Um, Probably, we don't know that for a fact, but that's a reasonable hypothesis. Um, the issue is we can't do it right now because there are no tests out there. I think um, I'm a parent of a child who is under 18 and I would not give these vaccines without the efficacy data for her. And uh, I don't think any doctor would recommend it if it's not licensed for that age group and which is why it's exceptionally important that clinical trials continue and we continue to do targeted trials for age groups um, that we need to vaccinate in the real world. Question from Dwaraganathan. Uh, he is asking whether the yogic practice like Surya Namaskar, Pranayama, immunity developing asanas, along with protective measures, say social distancing, face mask wearing and sanitation could help from COVID-19? And its variant. I okay. So I will say this in general because this in in ISRC we addressed in multiple ways. Please, what is critical for maintaining your machine, that is your body, good exercise, managing stress, sleep, good food. If yoga is part of your normal regime, good healthy food. All of these are going to keep your body functioning at the best possible level that it can. And that is, of course, this general health is going to be important for how you face any disease, right? So I would encourage everybody to man do all of these four things that a particular thing that if I do this kind of yoga or if I eat that kind of food, will I be protected especially against COVID-19? There is no evidence so far to suggest any of that. So I would be very careful to think of those as panaceas for this particular disease or for that matter, any other particular disease. But I encourage everybody to take care of these four pillars of general health. You need healthy food, exercise of whatever kind you want, manage your stress well, get enough sleep. Sleep, super important. Another question this question from Deepika are recovered people 
then not likely to infect others um the so it would be it i think the data so far suggests that reinfection is a very low probability event it's not as if 20% even of the people are getting reinfected it seems to be a low probability event nonetheless i would say that it is a non zero event we certainly have examples in the world where people have gotten in uh, reinfected but the chance is low even if you have recovered from covid 19 please continue to wear a mask and wash your hands um and you know i think those are good practices to follow till the uh, pandemic really tapers off to a very low level next question have mrna vaccines from pfizer and moderna tested on pregnant women i think you have answered it no 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 it has not yet been done are there disease where where immunity as a result of recovery from a natural full infection is better than derived from a vaccine uh, i don't think there's something better because these are two ways of priming your immune system so that it can fight off re reinfection um i wouldn't say that they're just differently you prime your immune system so that you can have a good response against that particular pathogen uh i would say from my uh, from uh, from my own perspective it's better to get the chicken pox vaccine than chicken pox because if you get the chicken pox vaccine you don't have to worry as much about getting shingles others where you get chicken pox especially now with long lived population some fraction of people will get shingles so there are these kinds of issues to think about and so so far if you get your regime where you get multiple doses what is you are assured of is that you for most diseases you will get sufficient protection so that you don't get disease sterilizing immunity is offered by almost you know i very few if any vaccine or if you get it the, the severity of the disease will be very low so i would say that on balance that is the way to go because you why would you want to get sick i i wouldn't and i think most people wouldn't i mean so much better to be healthier then the question from manoj is taking the vaccine safe for elderly people say above 80 years we don't have the data but the idea would be that we have looked at 60 to 75 only small number of participants for some of the vaccines um but i think this is where you will have to take the advice of um, uh, public health uh, individuals as well as your doctor um for what i would choose to do is this is i would think is probably an acceptable risk if you are above 80 to at least discuss it with your doctor for the possibility of taking the vaccine but it's absolutely true that we need greater numbers of people taking it of various I mean, we need a little bit more data and i think we'll have much greater confidence uh, vijayan one moment uh, deepika raised her hands can we ask her to ask question yeah Uh, Deepika, you are unmuted. You can ask now. Thank you. Yeah, hi, hi, Sandhya. It was really awesome presentation. Yeah, so the the question I had was I was asking about uh, the person who is uh, uh, recovered. So whether they can infect others. I what I meant to ask was if the person is recovered, this person is less likely to get a bigger uh, load of virus. In so suppose that person is not using mask and can get infect. I mean, uh, is come does come across some virus load. so virus would get in them but it will not increase to a load which can infect that person but still can that person still pass on the virus to others if they come across without so the so the idea is that first of all i should say that we don't have that data right because this is public health data you need someone with a second infection and then know whether the people who are in contact pick up that infection so we that data is not there so i'm just going to give you what i think is a likely scenario but to say that that data is not there let us say that you get exposed and you start growing this bug in your nose and goes down but your body is happily fighting it off it's as if you're exactly. vaccinated right you yeah. can it's as if you're vaccinated 
but you can we don't have any evidence to suggest that these people cannot infect someone else mm. there isn't that evidence but that less likely true. can we say i wouldn't even say that it's going to so, depend on the it's going to depend on the viral variant what if it is the uk variant which can even a much lower dose infect people okay so so let's take a case wherein the person is first time getting infected say first time come come back come across the virus load and at which stage is that person likely to infect others it will not be immediately till the so at least what we know about uh, uh, sars cov 2 is that you can start infecting people even before you have symptoms like even a day after the chances are lower when you have symptoms your ability to infect others is higher if the and the symptoms can be very mild right it can just be that you have a sore throat we know people who have got uh, covid 19 and the only fear, only symptom they have is sore throat so you can infect people with very mild symptoms you can infect pre symptomatically it's much much lower so those principles are not going to change whether it's your first or second infection which is why the concept of herd immunity how many people are there can you break that circulating chain are there enough people who even if they are infected they themselves will not get disease and do they take sufficient precautions so that the people who are not infected uh, so far and don't have the vaccine still don't transmit that is the abundant caution that is needed for public health measures so the people who are asymptomatic can pass the infection pretty comfortably if they can it's right. at much lower so, at much lower level but they can asymptomatic but then they have a less load of virus therefore they are asymptomatic we don't have we don't know if it is less load of virus we don't know that right how do you measure that what is the load of virus right that is the expectation that the viral load is low and then they become symptomatic and then they recover um but there are people who don't get symptoms at all and then their chance of infection as i said is low is very low uh but i won't say very low but it is low and we now know that and we don't know it depends on so many things which are not related to our immune system it's the right, way right. we talk it's the way we breathe it is if we shout and how many tooli hal come out of our mouth mm -hmm. how can we control this you know those are difficult things to address i mean the minimum infectious dose what you're really coming to as a scientific question which is unanswered is what is the minimum infectious dose that you need for a particular variant we have only correlations that the uk is spreading more so likely it's you know um, much it needs it will be a much lower dose and it will give you disease and it will spread and Thank the you. previous variant was not like that but we don't Thank have that answer. Yeah. and i don't want to say we know something when we don't and i'm giving you what might be a best guess answer i last one not to ask his question yeah Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Sandhya Kaushika, madam. Yeah, uh, I have uh, two questions, I believe. First one is I already asked about elderly uh, people taking vaccine. Is it safe? Now, one more thing is, inf how about infants like newborn to one no. year? Not tested. Absolutely, please don't. Really. i think it is 16 to 65 or 70 which is the age range uh, which has been tested for various vaccines uh, some is from 18 to 75 some is been from 16 to 70 in that range we have data for one or the other vaccine definitely kids under 16 uh, especially infants i would not recommend it unless we have data which shows that a it is safe and b it has efficacy both are extremely important you don't want to give something to a to a child whose immune system is still developing okay so for now they have to wait uh, absolutely wait till, uh, they have to wait and you should yeah. recognize that that is the age group at least uh, you know people who are between the ages of 5 to 18 generally seem to fair well even if they get the disease there are some people who have kawasaki syndrome and they have uh, poor outcomes and uh, but a lot of them actually fair well you know even if they catch it they do well so 
they are the people in effect if they wait it might still be okay but uh, people what, what who have that, comorbidities that, yeah people who have diabetes obesity hypertension people who are above uh, you know in every population it's slightly different sometimes sometimes the inflection point in some population is above 60 for some others it's about 50 some countries it's above 50 so those decision as to how the priority groups are decided is going to be based on country specific outcome data of hospitalizations as well as mortality young young children have more immunity against uh, the covid 19 i heard no like no that. no no there there isn't it's just that if they get infected their outcomes are better okay 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 and one they more question they don't have madam. more immunity yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and my next question is i heard that like uh, the these vaccines are made not uh, by from virus some viral material only is used to uh, prepare yeah, the depends. vaccine i heard it yeah. depends so the, so i'm sorry it was not clear when i gave the talk yes, the it. mrna vaccine as well as the astrazeneca um, adenovirus uh, platform vaccine is only a small portion which is the spike protein okay, uh, okay. which is how the spike protein how the virus gets in the bharat biotech vaccine is taking the entire vaccine it grows up the vaccine in large quantities and makes it inactive but the whole vaccine is present whole virus is present all virus will be there yeah all virus is present in the bharat biotech and it inactivated okay. whereas these other platforms only a small fraction of the virus is present okay thanks a lot madam it was a nice uh, uh, like presentation thanks a lot see you thank Bye. you for so let me jump back to the questions in the chat box um uh, the next question is uh, any studies about covid-19 vaccine correlate with uh, ILI like h1 h1 n1 um, i i i guess i don't understand what ili is hmm. okay uh, let us i apologize i i don't know what ili is so i i think you know if somebody emails me a little bit the person who asked the question uh, emails me it's then it's influenza related up. illnesses and yeah Oh, that's all okay. <laughs> okay. so sorry what was the question again yeah this any studies about covid 19 vaccine correlate with other ili flu, oh, flu that's vaccine it, that's it. That's will, will it will it no they are completely different uh, viruses they are completely different bugs so getting the covid uh, uh, vaccine against uh, sars cov 2 which causes covid 19 is in no way going to affect whether you will get the flu or not you will get the flu if you get exposed to it and you know it sort of takes residence in your lungs you will get the flu covid-19 vaccine is not going to protect you against that very different uh, bug very different the next question is now in the background of mutation that may arise which will be preferable vaccine covid shield or covid covaxin <laughs> <laughs> your guess is as good as mine because um the neutralizing activity that is being measured in vitro in 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 uh, tissues uh, in in you know, cells and culture or uh, in through these animal studies are all based on the idea of neutralizing that is when the antibody coats the virus then it cannot bind to the receptor on the cell surface and get internal so obviously something against the spike if it works well is an obvious way to block that interaction now if you have an entire virus present um and you have variants which are there do does binding to the other parts of the virus block the ability of the spike to see that we don't know um yet so the answer is we don't know that answer yet there's no reason to assume that both vaccines are not useful and helpful to finally combat um, the disease that would get this sars cov 2 infection a question from vivek <clears throat> considering the recent result that have shown immunity last at least 8 months plus mumbai zero survey result plus the reducing case load in india the current city crowds perhaps the herd immunity is here 
<laughs> very difficult question to answer that herd immunity is already here because it depends, as I will see again, it depends on the circulating strains. We typically do not sequence them. Um, I think what has really improved, and as I said, it varies in place to place, even in cities, like uh, when you talked about the first zero survey that came out, which was between uh, BMC, NISI, IOG, and TIFR. Um, what was very clear was high density places and low density places varied. But if you look at you know large populations, even in cities who have managed due to their ability to protect themselves, maybe living in residence complexes where they're able to shield in some way, I'm sure they don't have a lot of prevalence. So it's really neighborhoods and hotspots. So I think thinking in terms of herd immunity in the absence of a vaccine is, we are not there yet. And I think we should be very careful about using that term, except in the context of a vaccine. Although I know there are other people who are doing it. I will emphasize again, as I have said many times, we know population level list, we don't know what individual outcomes are. I can tell you that just in Mumbai, if you look at uh, the housing complex where I stay in, I'm sure the prevalence is not 50% of zero survey. I am sure of it. Because we've just all tried to be extremely careful. We have managed to come in. So when we go outside, maybe there are other people who are protected. But what's to say that it's been eight months in, maybe they got effect, uh, infected in April, maybe next uh, coming March, there'll be small numbers of them who can get reinfected and maybe that's all somebody who's not infected will get. So this individual risk is important to consider. Uh, and therefore, let's, as far as possible, at least for the vulnerable people, we should make the effort to make sure, and I'm sure the government will do this well, uh, make sure that they have the vaccine. Another question from Aparna. Wearing mask whole day is so suffocating. And when it is uh, avoidable to venture into public, are there any other alternative to protect ourselves? Unfortunately, that seems to be there is scientific data to suggest that it really helps. I think there are some things you can do to make yourself careful. I mean, I can tell you that it's very difficult with glasses. I have glasses when I wear masks, it just fogs up. But there are some tricks that my daughter found in YouTube videos for me to use you know, maybe double masking or something. What I do is I just remove my glasses, choose the correct mask, which is I always uh, use uh, now for extended periods of time. I use fabric masks. I remove it and put it on in the right way. I keep an extra with me. So if I'm in a place where I'm distanced from other people um, and I'm outdoors, I remove it and put it away carefully. Uh, and then just from the sides, so I'm not touching the front of it and I keep an extra. So these are the things which, we have to do to help ourselves. I know it is difficult, but it's not only in our interest, but in the interest of many other people who we interact with on a daily basis. Several of us are our loved ones because each of us has a very tight network of people that we interact with on a weekly basis. It's for both of us. So I think there are ways to make ourselves more comfortable. If you're an outdoor and distance from people, you don't have to stand there wearing a mask and take it out for some time. And that's what I do personally. If, if I'm feeling very suffocated, I make sure I'm very like 10 feet away from anybody. If it's possible, then I take it out carefully, breathe for a minute or two, become comfortable, all that sweat is falling on, then I put it back on. But it is, I completely admit, it's difficult. And I use cloth masks. I don't use surgical masks. The blue masks are the very worst because, you know, it's sort of. So there are things that we can do to help ourselves and to help our program with time. I understand the difficulty. So this One question from mind. question from Jam. How do I understand whether what I have is a normal reaction or a bad reaction to the vaccine and what should one do? Okay, so usually by the time a vaccine comes out into the public, you have some idea of what is an adverse reaction, what can be expected because some of them will be documented. Uh, normal reactions typically are what your own children will face or what you might have seen when you have gotten booster doses when you need to maybe travel to certain countries. 
you will have local pain, local swelling, headache, maybe a mild fever. But if you get anything where you start seeing you have difficulty moving your arms or legs, go immediately to the hospital. Contact your healthcare provider immediately. Don't wait. This is not something that you wait on because uh, neurological symptoms uh, are something to be really concerned about if they start happening to you. But those are typical. There are also other things where they talk about and there are universal standards which have come up with. You can look at the Gavi website about you know, vaccine safety and, and I can, Jam, since you asked it to me, I can send you that link or I can try to put it up uh, here as well. And um, there are agreed upon things, neurological symptoms, heart symptoms, etc. But I think the neurological symptoms are what will be cut the most uh, commonly by themselves. So don't wait. If you see there are difficulties in moving any part of your body, just go to the hospital right away. The question from Dr. DRG. View, your view on controversies regarding the co-vaccine vaccines sufficiently not tested? Um, it appears so. As I said, only some, even the even the Russian vaccine and the Chinese vaccine, all of the data is not out. There is some amount of data that's out. And I know there is great need for bringing these vaccines on board so that we can all open up a little bit more. Uh, we continue to have to take precautions, but we can open up some more and we can come back to having sufficient economic activity is very important. But let's also look at lots of questions which have come here today. What should I do? Can I get infected the second time? Should I be worrying about my kid? What about my elderly parent? Will it be safe? Um, those are the kinds of questions we have for which the trial will give you answer. So I think having independent review of uh, data is important. Um, and, you know, India has such a strong vaccine manufacturing and generating center. We should maintain our wonderfully high standards, which has served us well. We provide 60 to 70 percent of vaccines to the world. And I think it's nice. I mean, I understand there are considerations. You know, Russia is doing it. China is doing it. They're giving it out. They are, you know, there is soft diplomacy involved. There are people they are able to give. Uh, help to, which is a very nice feeling, but having the little data out, which will be for uh, for um, the Bharat Biotech vaccine, I'm sure by early next month, we will ha start having interim data. And I think that will give much greater confidence. There are a couple of this data is something you always want to see. <laughs> you know, it's like nothing. There's no two ways about it. As a scientist, you always want to see data. But sometimes you have to take good bets. As I said, you know, with an 80 year old, will you give a vaccine if the test is no, results are not there? Maybe not such a bad idea. You should discuss it with the doctor and see if that's a good outcome. You know, that's what, that was what my answer was. So finally, we have a couple of questions from Deepika and she can ask the question directly. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Raisa. Hi, Sandhya, yeah. Yeah, so I was looking for my daughter. She's now, uh, she's 12th and she's going to be giving her exams and all. We were wondering, like, KB by exam, three hours exam she used to be sitting in. I was wondering which kind of, she has tried with N95. It's very difficult to uh, sit please, through that. Please, yeah, no, please don't get an N95. In fact, I would recommend strongly against N95. If you want to listen to the science behind N95, IRCRC had a talk on masks by Anna Bhattacharya, who's been testing these various technologies at TIFR and these various masks. And I, I think a, a two or three layer cloth masks uh, will do a good job. And I think um, in a well-ventilated space, an exam center, hopefully they keep the windows open and the door open and maintain some degree of distancing, um, you will have, um, you know, you don't have to worry as much. That's what I'm saying. Oh, that's really great. And but uh, please and look, please, please look at the data you can see in his talk. It's on the ISRC UB YouTube channel. And the person I, who delivered the okay. talk was Anna Bhattacharya. Anna Bhattacharya, and that person is whom? Whom he interviewed? Uh, he's uh, he's uh, in T a faculty member in TIFR. And I think he gave such a talk even for COVID Gyan. 
uh, YouTube channel. So either one of those uh, places you can see his uh, talk, and I think you will uh, you will get the information that you need. the mask uh, doubts will be cleared because we are right as you said we are keeping two masks and we N95 I am keeping two but I am feeling suffocated quite a bit. So One I will keep, the other I will use. In fact, in N95, it's particularly bad because if the, the filter is clogged, you have absolutely, it's like not having a mask at all. Uh, and basically. we're using it, re reusing it, and it's not working. Yeah. Maybe. So the, the other thing is the reuse can, if you want to reuse an N95, steam it over hot water to kill everything in its path. But it could still get clogged by dust, in which case it will not work well. So I, you know, a good surgical mask, cloth mask, it will do the job reasonably well. And it's something which... So do we need two layers of surgical mask for exam center? No, I, I, would, I would just take ordinary two-layer, three-layer mask, which you can even make homemade. By yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Great. Just thanks a lot. Cloth mask. Right. Thanks a lot. Thank if you, you're sir. terribly worried, you ask her to wear a shield as well, you know, which will cover her eyes and, you know. So, yeah. But the most important thing is to maintain the physical distance once you have the mask and also to have... The because we, we don't have that in our control. Once the center is there, we just have to sit there. <laughs> but I think everybody is cognizant of this issue and wants to yeah. sort of help as much as possible. I mean, that's really actually a very nice part of... Uh, uh, India that people recognize it. I think there's been a real difficulties as someone said wearing a mask is so uncomfortable. Those are real difficulties exist, but I think people do want to comply as much as possible. Or at least large numbers of people do. Want right, to. right. One more last question. Uh, are minerals and vitamins recommended along with the after infection with along with uh, dexamethasone? Uh, that is a, for treatment. I think it's best if a medical doctor uh, gives it to, you know, suggest what is necessary right. at that time for you. It is, it is inappropriate for me as a scientist to yeah. suggest anything. I'm just asking in general. What, but in general. in general, people who have, you take a healthy, normal diet, uh, you know, and get exposure to sun, have sufficient vitamin D coming in into their body and eating healthy food. Usually, this is not a concern that people have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. But if there are other issues, the issues of obesity, issues of gut problems where you're not absorbing things, then of course, supplements are valuable and important at that time. But those are, again, decisions that you will take with your doctor. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Sandhya. Thank you, Vijayan Sandhya. Thank you. So this is the last question, uh, the question from Dwaraganathan. Um, so it's a long question, but I'll read the last sentence. One. Is there a, any chance that COVID-19 subside itself? Well, I can only say so far, it's not showing any sign of just vanishing. <laughs> now, wouldn't because it he's, be nice if he's he woke asking up the evidence? No, no, he is asking the evidence of Sp Spanish influence. After two years, it, it has gone on its own, no? So, so we, 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 uh, this kind oh, of thing will happen. <laughs> so I think what happened with Spanish, so the flu comes in waves and flu changes. Please remember the, the, the influenza virus undergoes a lot of change and recombination and new strains arise at all, you know, at times. So that level of change is very high, which is why you need an updated flu vaccine every year. SARS-CoV-2 and generally coronaviruses have error correction mechanisms and they do not change as much. We have these small variants which are arising due to natural mutation because of very, very large numbers of people who are infected and within people, there, you know, a lot of replication of the virus takes place. But uh, so it's unlikely... So the flu and the trajectory of a flu epidemic is going to be different from the coronavirus epidemic because of the nature of the virus itself. And therefore, expecting it to suddenly vanish completely, unlikely. Okay. So, so someone asked, is it safe to go to school and college? If you follow all the precautions, and have reasonably well ventilated spaces. I think uh, it is possible that the government, I'm sure, is thinking about that as well to open up in a safe manner. 
Okay. It's kind of Come. hard doing online learning all the time. Yeah. Excellent talk, Sanjay. <laughs> So we covered all the questions and it's it's a time to close the session. Um, Diyarji, do, do you want to say anything? Or no, 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 that's it? fine. It's fine. You thank, a word of thanks. You yeah, yeah, it's it's a formal word of thanks because it's a, a, <laughs> uh, we see the, the way in which Dr. Sandhya has done the presentation and interacted with the mass, and it is exemplary. It's two hours. <laughs> yeah, two hours, and it's, two it's, hours. it's very, very friendly interaction, and uh, everyone likes it. And uh, definitely, um, I would like to thank Dr. Sandhya for her two hour time, and it's an excellent presentation. Uh, thank you, like and sorry I didn't have slides in Tamil, but uh, <laughs> I, think, I will uh, send you the slides. I should add that Sandhya is formally enrolled in Tamil Nadu Science Forum now. So you also consider him as part of the Yeah, let me. Yeah, I, I will include her in, uh, in our in our email list, so we can exchange the. It, it would activity. be very nice if yeah. you could, uh, you know, join us and all the sure. That would be nice. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I will be happy to do so. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I, I'll I'll thank the participant uh, for being. Um, patient to sit with us for two hours and ask questions. And I'll also thank Dr. Uh, SK for arranging the speaker. And I, I'll thank Dr. Jam and uh, TRG um, who bring wonderful resources to us continuously, including this resource. Um, I hope that they will continue to do the, um, uh, help us to organize such meetings. I, my special thanks go to, goes to them. With that, we'll um, the next meeting. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, the next meeting is going to be held on uh, 23rd of this month at 4 o'clock. This is going to be uh, a lecture on um, ancient metallurgy, particularly focusing on the uh, metallurgy in uh, Chola period, Chola kingdom. Um, so it was a, a, the speaker is uh, Sharada Srinivasan. Uh, Sharada Srinivasan from Bangalore. Um, Nias, Nias, National Institute of Advanced Studies. Yeah, uh, Nias Bangalore, and uh, she has done some research on those um, uh, uh, the Stola brands and other things. And she will be presenting, giving a nice presentation on the metallurgy uh, uh, in ancient times. Um, so I would like, uh, I would request all the participants to. I will, we will send you the formal uh, invitation and the, um, posters to you. Uh, I request you to get registered in, um, and attend the meeting as well. Uh, so with that announcement, I, I will again ask you to fill up the feedback form. Uh, that will help us to um, improve further. Uh, so with these few words, let me conclude. I, will, I would like to conclude this session. Thank you very much. Thank you.